join me over in Luke chapter 20 this morning. Luke chapter 20, maybe starting in verse 9. As you're turning there, just a little bit of reminder where we're at in the life and ministry of Jesus. We are at the final week, Passover. The cross is almost upon Christ. Do we... A couple weeks ago, we were at the triumphal entry, which was Sunday, as Jesus entered in triumphantly, remember? Righteous and having salvation on the little donkey, fulfilling the scripture and presenting himself to Israel as their Messiah, as their king, and they were celebrating and worshiping. Then it was probably Monday or Tuesday, he went into the temple courts and he saw the filth, he saw the desecration, and he cleansed the temple and drove all the, the creatures and the, the crooks that were trading the, the money and, and uh, threw them all out. You got to go. Cleaned up the Father's house. And of course, that was pronouncing judgment upon all the religious leaders that allowed the desecration of the temple. And we learn in chapter 19, verse 47, that they were actively trying to kill Jesus. Well, they've been talking about it for a while now in the final week of the Lord's life. They're actually trying to plot his demise, make it happen. But they were afraid of the crowds, so that's why they found Judas at night to betray Jesus when the crowds were not there, because the crowds at that moment loved Jesus. Later they wouldn't, but... We saw last week, there was a delegation, if you remember, from the Sanhedrin, from the ruling council who came to Jesus as he was teaching and preaching the gospel in the temple courts. And they came up to him to try to trap him, try to uh, discredit him in front of the people, if you remember. And they had a question, well, you know, what, by what authority are you doing these things? Things like cleansing the temple, coming in triumphantly into Jerusalem. What authority? And they thought they could uh, you know, discredit Christ. But remember, there was... One little question, Jesus turned it around to control the whole conversation, and one question messed them all up, right? Well, John's baptism, I'll tell you, I'll tell you if you answer me, John's baptism from heaven or from men? And then they huddled up and had to talk about it, recall, or remember? And, and they claimed they didn't know. It was the only safe answer they could come up with. <laughs> and, and now they were trapped, and they were discredited in front of the people. Hmm, you, you spar with the master, you're always going to lose. Stubborn pride, remember? We talked about that last week. Stubborn pride. That was the problem with these religious leaders, and it's the problem with all unbelievers. It's stubborn pride, and it's a problem with authority. I want authority over my life to rule and reign in my life the way I want to. Nobody, not even God, can tell me what to do. And that's the problem with these guys, and that's what the problem with everybody on planet Earth until we submit to the authority of Christ. So that's where we were last week. The devil tried to prevent that. Hmm. On several occasions throughout the service last week, if you recall, it was kind of crazy. I'd never felt so ill at that moment. <laughs> and things were strange and happening. Hmm. Two of our, our, our parishioners woke up that morning and feeling impressed to pray for me, feeling impressed to pray against the powers of darkness for, this, for that Sunday. Hmm. So let's be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. I think it was also a bit of a wake-up call, too, that we are in a battle. The enemy's real. He doesn't want the authority of Jesus to be preached and proclaimed or any of the Bible, right? Absolutely not. So they'll try to do whatever he can. I don't want to give him too much credit, but he has power. But Jesus defeated him, and the word of God was preached, right? Blessed be Jesus. So be, be praying for your pastor. Be praying for the congregation. Be praying for one another continually. Well, this morning we're going to see Jesus still in the temple courts. He's got that same crowd around him. He's got those same Jewish uh, leaders from the Sanhedrin there that are around him. And since he's got all their attention, he's now going to give them, I think might be his very last parable in the Gospel of Luke. We have the parable of the tenants before us this morning. So if you'll stand with me out of reverence for God's holy word and let us read our passage, Luke 20, starting at verse 9, he speaks this to the crowd and to the religious authorities and to you and me. He went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, rented it to some farmers, and went away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent another servant 
But that when they also beat and treated shamefully and sent him away empty-handed, he sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my son, whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, May this never be. Jesus looked directly at them and asked, What then is the meaning of that which is written, The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone? Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew that he had spoken the parable against them, but they were afraid of the people. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 You may be seated. So as we get into this parable, remember a nice a little kitschy way, to, a cute little way to remember what a parable is. It's a... Uh, uh, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Right? I like that. It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. But we have five characters. Five characters I want to make sure we really grasp this morning that are here given to us in the parable. We've got first the owner of the vineyard. Okay, The one who owns the vineyard. He's the master. He owns all the land. He worked and created the vineyard himself. He prepared the soil. He took out all the rocks. That's what they'd have to do. Pull the rocks out of the soil. He tilled it. He, he planted the choicest vines there. Uh, this parable is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And the other Gospels give us a little uh, other information, which is something everybody did when they built a vineyard. But they would build a wall around the vineyard for protection. They'd build a tower to overlook the vineyard. And that way they could see anybody robbing or taking or the little foxes eating or whatever it was. And they could deal with these problems. They would carve out or dig out a wine press. This is what the master did. This is what the owner, he put all of this together. It all originated with him, and this is a clear picture of God the Father. Okay? This is a clear picture. The owner is God in this parable. Second uh, character in the parable is the vineyard itself, actually. The vineyard itself is a character, and what's the vineyard supposed to do? Make grapes, right? Produce fruit. That's what it's supposed to do. Now, this is a character. Um, maybe we don't grasp it so much, but the Old uh, Testament tells us that uh, the vineyard is absolutely a picture of the nation of Israel. Okay? So the nation of Israel is the vineyard that's supposed to be producing grapes. And the religious leaders that are standing right before Jesus would have clearly understood what he was talking about. And we see at the end of the parable that they, they, they grasped exactly what Jesus was saying, that he was speaking against them. God planted Israel with his own hands, if you will. It's a very special nation that he crafted, different than all the other nations, because he started with one man, we call him Father Abraham, remember him? And he let the nation grow, and they prospered, and they were into the millions, and they were down in Egypt, but they then were taken into slavery by Pharaoh, and God sent a deliverer, and he, he saved him, and he brought him out, and eventually he brought him to the promised land, and he blessed them tremendously and gave them this amazing land. Great miraculous things that he did for Israel. They were the, the apple of his eye. They were the nation through which he would display his power and his glory to the world, and he did. And the nation through which he would bring his beloved son, Jesus, which he did. Very special, handcrafted nation. And all he ever asked the vineyard to do was produce good fruit. That's it, guys. Just make good grapes and give it back to me in worship and glory. Right? Just obey my laws and my commands. Make good fruit, good grapes, and it's all going to be great. That's all they had to do. Let me read to you from Isaiah chapter 5. All right, down for your notes or if you're fast, you can turn over there. But Isaiah 5, starting in verse 1, this is called the Song of the Vineyard. The song of the vineyard. Verse 1. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. Okay, Israel. He dug it up and cleared it of its stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower 
in it and cut out a wine press as well, just like they all did when they made a, a vineyard. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. The sad story of the nation of Israel. Handcrafted by God, and they made bad fruit. And he goes on, he says, Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. Listen carefully. What more could have been done for my vineyard that I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? He says, What more could I have done for the nation? I was there with them. I've blessed them so much. I've given them the prophets and the word of God and the laws and the commands and the blessings. And even my only son, what more could God do for them? And he talks about, well, since they're not producing anything, he's going to tear it down. He's going to destroy it. And down in verse 7, it says, The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of of Israel, very clearly. Okay, The vineyard is the nation of Israel. The men of Judah are the garden of his delight. He loves, he loves Israel. What more could he have done? All right, and the third character we see are the farmers or the tenants, these caretakers that are entrusted with the vineyard. Okay, They're a big character here. Um, they didn't build the vineyard. They don't own it. They didn't, you know, build all these things. They, they're just caretakers. They're renters is all they are. And what do they do? They tend the vines and they collect the harvest. And then at a certain time of year, they're to give the bulk of the crop back to the owner because he owns it all. And they keep a little bit for themselves. That's their pay. That's how the arrangement was to be. And their job was to help the vineyard produce good fruit. Right? You trim and you water and you do your little thing. And you're supposed to help the vines to grow and, and, and that good fruit. Because if it wasn't good fruit, the owner's going to say, you're out of here. You're not doing your job. I'll get somebody else. So their job is to produce good fruit. They're the religious leaders. Okay, That's who these farmers, these tenants are. They're the religious leaders. The ones plotting the death of Jesus. Their job was simply to teach the people the laws and the commands of God. To, to get the nation to produce good fruit of love and obedience to the Lord. And when Messiah came, then bring all the fruit to Jesus. That, that was what their job was. But instead, they didn't do that, did they? Hmm. This ruling council, the Sanhedrin that is before Jesus, or at least a delegation from them, well, they hate the Lord. Hmm. They're not doing their jobs. They're, they're, they're wretched Tenants is what they are. Wretched tenants. Hmm. Fourth, we have the servants sent from the master. Sent from the owner of the land. He sends out these servants. And what are they doing? These servants come and they're supposed to probably get their wagons and their barrels and they're going to get the wine and the grapes and the raisins and all that kind of stuff and bring it back to the owner. Who are these guys? These guys are the prophets of God from the Old Testament. The prophets of God. God sent Israel over and over again, his men. And what they were to do, they were to go to the nation and they were to call forth fruit unto God. Stop your sin. <laughs> you're messing around. You're not serving God. Get your act together. Repent. Serve God. And then you're going to obey him. Right? You're going to bring good fruit back to the one who owns everything. That's the job of the prophets so repeatedly they would come and call forth good fruit from the nation. Let me read to you from Jeremiah 7. Jeremiah 7, 25. From the time your forefathers left Egypt until now, day after day, again and again, I sent you my servants, the prophets. But they did not listen to me or pay attention. They were stiff-necked and did more evil than their forefathers. So Jesus, through this parable, is talking about the history of the nation of Israel leading up unto himself. And he's saying, many, many men of God, messengers have come, but you didn't listen. You didn't care. And finally, the last character in this wonderful parable is none other than the blessed beloved son. And we know that's the Lord Jesus, right? He is the beloved son sent from the father, the owner of all things to call forth Good fruit from the nation of Israel. Call forth good fruit from the world. Each human being to give love and reverence to God through Christ. 
So those are the wonderful characters that we have before us. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets, at many times and in various ways. Over and over again, he sent the prophets, he sent these messengers. He says, verse 2, But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. Okay, Jesus, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. Uh, we talked about that last week. Jesus made it all. Notice by the parable, um, Jesus is the last one to come. We're not expecting anybody else to come from heaven unless it's the return of Christ. There's no other, there's no other prophet that's going to show up and really show us how it's done. That's the problem with all these people that came after, like Muhammad and Joseph Smith and some of these Ridiculous people. They came afterwards. Well, it was all wrong. Let me tell you what it's really like. No, no. But this parable teaches us that Jesus is the last. He's the greatest revelation of the Father. They we're expecting nobody else except for Jesus at the second coming. The prophet spoke, and now Christ has spoke. Hmm. All right, into our parable, verse one or verse uh, nine. He went on to tell the people this parable: A man planted a vineyard rented it to some farmers, and went away for a long time. Okay, so God built Israel. He planted her, and he said, bear some fruit, guys. Love me, obey me. And you know what? We can see ourselves in this parable as well. Because we're also the vineyard of God, if you will. All human beings actually are the vineyard of God. Because he planted us, didn't he? Didn't he create you in your mother's womb? That wasn't your choice. You're like, well, I think I'll be created now. Right? No! You didn't choose to be born. You didn't choose to, to look the way you look and have the gifts that you have. I was singing down there thinking, boy, I sound horrible. But God loves it. It's okay. But I, well, I wish I could sound nice. But sometimes the voice is just not going to happen, you know? I cannot choose these things. They're gifts from God. God planted the vineyard and he created in us what he wants us to be. What to look like and if we can sing or not, all those things. I can't, I can't determine you know, these things. I can't make the food that I put in my mouth. Well, I can take a seed and put it in the ground and something grows and I can eat it, but I didn't make the seed. I didn't make the ground. I didn't make the sunshine on it or the water get on it. I can't make it sprout out. God planted us. We are his vineyard. He's the one, the designer and the creator of all these things. I didn't make the air that I breathe. Huh. Oh, we think we're so high and mighty, don't we? Huh. What can we do? So all we have and all we are came from God. We are his creation. He planted us. And this is what he said, now bear good fruit. Right at the garden, Adam and Eve. And that didn't work out so good. And here we are in a big mess because of all our sin. Because we're not bearing good fruit until we come under the knowledge of Christ and surrender to his authority. And then we can get about the business of fruit for the kingdom. John chapter 15, that wonderful chapter. Jesus says to his disciples, he says to us, 15.5, I am the vine and you are the... Right? If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. That's the plan. Be close to Jesus and you're going to bear good fruit for the kingdom. Love and obedience to God. He says, but apart from me, you can do... Yeah, diddly squat. That's the Morris translation. <laughs> nothing. You can do nothing. Diddly squat without me. He goes on in verse 8 and says, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. It's to the glory of God when you're my disciple and you obey, then God gets the glory with your fruit. Keep Go home read chapter 15. There's more fruit in there. There's a lot more. Good stuff. I'll move on. Verse 10. At harvest time he sent a servant to the tenants. So they would give him some of the fruit for the vineyard. Just a quick thought before we go on, though. If we're God's vineyard, he told us to bear good fruit, then the lesson for today is, and I'll hit on it later, but are we bearing good fruit? Right? Are we really being obedient to God? Are we being the vineyard that he wants us to be? All right, verse 10. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. So at harvest time, the owner says, okay, we'll go down now with the wagons and all the stuff and, and gather up some stuff for me and bring it back. 
So he shows up, knocks on the door. Okay, here I am. And they greeted him with a beating. They grabbed the guy, they beat him, they pummeled him, they kicked him, and they threw him out and said, get out of here, we're giving you nothing. And he went back to the master empty-handed. That's pretty messed up. They wouldn't give a drop of the fruit to the one who owned it all. Verse 11. He sent another servant. But that one also they beat and treated shamefully and sent away empty-handed. Well, that's messed up again. So he goes with down another servant. He says, okay, guys, you got to give me some fruit. The master demands it. The owner of all things wants his take here. And what did they do? It even got worse. It looks like it escalated. They pummeled, they beat him, they kicked him. And then it said they treated him shamefully. And I don't know what that means, but I can only imagine, in my imagination, they beat him up and they strip him of his clothes and send him back to town naked. Poor guy. He's got a, how shameful is that? But that's what they did to the prophets, remember? The servants that are coming are the prophets of God to the nation of Israel. And they abused them and they beat them and they killed some of them and they mocked them. Hmm. Jesus masterfully in this parable is telling the religious leaders and the crowds, this is the story of Israel leading up unto himself. This is what you guys have done. And they wouldn't give him any fruit of the obedience. Verse 12 he sent still a third, a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. It's completely out of control. Completely out of control. It's escalating. They wounded him. I'm thinking they stabbed him with something. He went and he, he died later or something. This is bad. Now, if you look at this, you have to almost ask a question. You almost have to ask, what's wrong with the owner? Because he's just sending these vulnerable little dudes out there. One guy gets beat up. Second guy gets beat up. Third guy gets all beat up, maybe killed. And you have to ask the owner, what's going on with this guy? Why would he do such a thing? Why would he keep sending these people only to be abused, these messengers? Why? Because, I mean, if it was me, after one time, I'd be calling the cops. And if there are no cops in the ancient day, I'd grab all my you know, servants with swords. We'd go down there and put it in their face and say, you're out now. Come back again, you're dead. You're out of here. That's what I would do. But that's not what the owner of all things did. Hmm. So what are we seeing? What's going on? What we're seeing here is a display of the patience and the mercy of our God. Right? Grace overflowing continually to a rebellious house, to an ungrateful people, to wretched tenants. Psalm 103, verse 8 says that God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, hear that, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. Slow to anger. That's why he sent one and then another and then another. Oh yeah, they got beat up and killed, but they're going to have a great reward one day. But the Lord was displaying his patience and his grace. Because if God was not slow to anger, where would we be? Understand, we're really the wretched tenants. Huh. See, outside looking in, we go, oh, what is that master doing? That's ridiculous. I would never do that. But if we put ourselves in the story, we go, oh, thank you, Jesus. Right? Because if you weren't slow to anger, if you didn't, if weren't patient with me, I would be in hell. I wouldn't make it. So it looks different when I'm on the inside. It's crazy, crazy grace and gentleness. Repeatedly. Oh, he sent the message. How many messengers, if you could go back and look at your, your life before Christ, how many messengers did he send that you sent packing? Okay. A mom, a dad, a grandma, a cousin, a friend, somebody at church, a pastor, a Bible, someone on TV preaching Jesus. I don't know. How many, how many messages, messengers came your way and you're like, nah, 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 forget that, Right? But then when we said yes, and then when we stopped turning the messengers away and said yes to Jesus, we found life and forgiveness and wholeness. So the, 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 the continued grace of God, just it's, it's just he's waiting for us to be saved. That's why judgment hasn't already come. Look at our world. We deserve it. We've deserved it for a long time. But it hasn't come because God wants more to be saved. Oh, Lord, thank you. Help us.
Notice here these tenants that are beating these guys up, sending them away. They're acting like they own the vineyard. Right? They think they own it. This is in your vineyard. It's ours. Get out of here. We're giving you nothing. The religious leaders of Israel were acting this way. They acted as if they owned the nation. They acted as if they owned the vineyard. Jesus said about the Pharisees and the religious leaders that all they did was for show. Everything they did was for men to see so they could get honored and praised. So they could be adored by the masses. They wanted the fruit from the nation to flow to them. They wanted the power and the authority and the control and the praise. They didn't want to give it to God. They didn't want to give it to Jesus when he came. They should have been teaching the people to give the praise to God, but they took it themselves. It's all pride. Selfish pride because they wanted the authority. We talked about that last week. Same thing now. Everybody who's rejecting Jesus and not living for Christ, it's about stubborn pride. And they want the authority. Because you know what? People think they own the vineyard, right? That's the deal. That's the whole problem with ma- planet Earth. <laughs> Mankind is they think they own the vineyard and they don't want to give the authority and the fruit to God. Hmm. How's your vineyard doing? Do you think you own it? God is gracious. But as we're going to see in this parable, His grace doesn't last forever. Now, if we thought the giving of a messenger and a messenger and a messenger was wild and gracious and patient, Wait until we look at verse 13. Because here we see the ultimate act of love, of mercy, of grace beyond measure. Verse 13, Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my son, whom I love. Perhaps, perhaps they will respect him. For God so loved the world. John 3, that's John 3.16. That he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I will send my beloved son perhaps, perhaps they will respect him. This is love incomprehensible, right? I could never do it. You would never do it. Nobody ever would. But God decided, I will even sacrifice my son to save those wretched tenants, to save the vineyard. As I read in Isaiah 5, talking about the song of the vineyard, it says, what more could I do for my vineyard? What more could God do with the giving of the prophets and the prophets and the prophets and then his only son to the nation who said, no, no for the most part. And that's why judgment came. But what about us? How many messengers does he send into our lives? And if we say no, 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 and we finally say no to Jesus, then there's nothing left, right? There's nothing left but judgment, as we will see. What more could God do for us than the giving of his only son? That perhaps... They might respect him. Well, some in Jesus' day did, for sure. The early church was made up of Jews, only Jews at the very beginning, until they left Jerusalem. But most did not respect the Son sent by the owner of all things. And some of us respect Christ today, but the majority do not, sadly. But he's patient, he's calling. And again, remember, there's no higher revelation. We're not expecting another prophet. It's Jesus. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He's the only way to the Father. We trust in Him or we don't make it. So are we living today with respect for the Son like we should be? Are we living under His authority, giving the good fruit to God through Christ? 
Verse 14, But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard, and they killed him. Notice they talked about it. They planned it. They plotted the death of the son. It's premeditated murder. It's exactly what the religious leaders were doing who were standing right in front of him. He's masterfully telling the story of the nation of Israel up until that very point, and he's calling these guys out and saying, you're trying to kill me, and I know it, and I'm even going to let you do it. He's also calling himself the beloved son. Hmm. The beloved son. Notice, Jesus says, this is my son whom I love. Sound familiar? Remember the baptism of Jesus? When he came up out of the water after identifying with sinful man on the Jordan banks there, the river, and, and he came out and the, the Spirit of God lighted on like a dove, and heaven cracks open and the voice of God says, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Mm. So he's saying, I am the son of God. And you're plotting my death. You're trying to kill me. No doubt they stepped back just a little bit and swallowed pretty hard. The crowd may not have got it all, but those religious leaders certainly did. Premeditated murder. He's calling him out. He's calling him out. And in this, where would they kill Jesus? Another prediction. It says they threw him out <clears throat> of the vineyard and then killed him. Jesus wasn't crucified inside the city of Jerusalem, but remember, he carried his cross for a time until he couldn't carry it any longer. Probably the great blood loss from the horrendous flogging. And they made Simon carry his cross out to the place of the skull, the place called Golgotha, outside the city. That's what he's talking about there. He's even predicting where they would crucify him. Notice this is what our world wants to do. They want to throw Jesus out. They want to own the vineyard, keep all the grapes, and throw Jesus out. Have you noticed America's been doing that for a while? We weren't founded on perfect Christ-like principles, but many good ones. Not all the founding fathers were truly Christians. Some were deists and so forth. But our money still says, in God we trust. One nation under God, right? We had a good start. We had a good godly start to our nation, but now we're throwing Jesus out. We want the vineyard. We have colleges that used to be establishments for God, producing ministers, and now they're these crazy colleges that are totally godless. You can't be a Christian teacher at Red Bluff High and in math class talk about Jesus. Somebody's going to get upset about that, and you might lose your job. Because they said, we want the vineyard, we're throwing Jesus out. It's stubborn, foolish pride. And our nation will be wrecked because of it, if it isn't already too late. But you and I can change our moment and our life and our families and the people around us as we trust in Jesus and spread the gospel. People of our world forget they're just renters and they don't own anything. And the messengers of God, they send packing. They don't want to listen to. You know, this is also the hallmark of all the cults and all the false religions. They throw Jesus out. They either have no Jesus at all, or if they do, they have a weak, worthless sort of a fellow they call Jesus, but he's not the Jesus of the Bible. He's not truly God. Oh, they'll just strip that right away. That first thing to go, get rid of God. So now he's this weak, emaciated, who knows what. He's not going to save you. He just... The father's really old, and he's decrepit. That's why we never see him. And he sends these messengers. So if we kill the son, he's got nobody to give the vineyard to, and we get it all. Oh, what morons. But sin blinds people. That's what sin does. Sin blinds us to the reality that God is not dead. They must have thought, maybe this old guy's dead. We get rid of the sun and everything's fine. But our sin blinds us. And we get stupid. We get stupid in our sin. Our world has forgotten that there is a God in heaven who made the vineyard. And he's not going to put up with our nonsense forever. How stupid is that, right? But yet we're blinded by the devil, by our own foolishness, our own sin. 
The owner of the vineyard is not going to just let the wickedness go on forever. What kind of owner would he be? The world says, God is dead. Hmm. Well, just wait. Just wait. So the question is, what then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? Verse 16, he will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. He'll kill them. And he'll give the vineyard to someone who will produce its fruit. If you remember back in chapter 19, verse 27, we ended uh, another parable. And it said, oh, those who didn't want me to be king, bring them here in front of me and kill them. Right in front of me, kill them. Talked about the return of Jesus. That's what he's going to do. He's going to slay all the rebellious and the wicked and pile up their dead bodies for the birds to eat. The, the owner of all things, he is so patient, right? Prophet after prophet, messenger after messenger, chance after chance after chance, and he gives his only son dying for us. But one day the patience and the mercy of God will be over. The door will be closed. And you're either in the kingdom or out of the kingdom, depending on what you've truly done with Christ. The Father will be outraged, and all his mercy will be gone. And what's left? Only vengeance. People get upset, oh, God's mean and vengeful, like those people in hell. <laughs> yeah, he does, after repeated efforts to save you. Foolish pride, desire for authority, wanting to own the vineyard. Hmm. It says here that he would give the vineyard to others. He would give the vineyard to others. The same parable uh, mentioned in a slightly different way in the Gospel of Matthew. Verse 21, or chapter 21, verse 43. It says, therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to people who will produce its fruit. He's talking about the Gentile world. The nation of Israel was to be judged. They were to be destroyed. Forty years later, the Romans came at the prediction of Jesus coming through, and they destroyed Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple. They didn't have a nation. They were scattered until 1948. Long, long time. The judgment of God. So the kingdom was given to the Gentiles. The, the Jews were broken off for a time. And the invitation was to the world now, come and produce fruit through Christ to God. What's a Gentile, if you're not familiar with that term? Well, if you're a Jew, there's only two types of people in the world. <laughs> you're a Jew or you're a Gentile. You're everybody else. So if you're not a Jewish person this morning, you're a Gentile. Acts 13, 46, Paul and Barnabas, they said, we have, speaking to the Jewish people, and they said, we had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you rejected it and did not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. So the offer of salvation came to everybody on the face of the planet that we might bear fruit for the kingdom of God. Verse 16, they will come and kill those tenants and give their vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, may this never be. Hmm. I wonder if they understood what Jesus was really saying or if they're just caught up in the story and thought, oh no, that's horrible for, the, for that to happen. Unless they really understood that maybe he meant them. And at that moment, they thought it wouldn't happen. I don't know. Verse 17, Jesus looked directly at them and asked, what then is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone or cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. Hmm. Jesus quotes to them Psalm 118. It's an interesting passage. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone of the cornerstone. The builders are the religious leaders. They're the tenants. 
In those days when you built a building, you build them out of stones, like the temple, huge, gigantic stones. They cut them out of the quarry, and the builders would go through, and they'd look at all the different stones, and he'd pick them out. But they took the one that was the, the cornerstone, the most important stone in the whole building, and they said, now nah, we don't want that one. And they tried to build a house without that one. Well, the Bible tells us that Jesus is the cornerstone. He is the most important stone in the whole building. So when they laid that cornerstone, it was everything to the building because when it was laid, it set the whole direction and course of the rest of the building. It was built off of that one, one stone. So to throw that out is completely worthless. But look at our world. Doesn't our world throw out the cornerstone? They reject the most important piece of life. And then they wonder why their lives are all messed up. I thought a lot of, well, maybe not a lot, but often about Anthony Bourdain. Remember him? Not that I've watched much of his shows or anything, but I, he seemed like a guy a lot of people liked, and he had a lot of money. He went to a lot of interesting places and ate a lot of good food, right? That's what he liked to do. And he made a ton of money in books and things. And then he hung himself in the middle of a shoot right? in Europe. He didn't come out of his room because he hung himself. People build and build a life. But if you don't build with the cornerstone of Christ, you're building an empty, empty thing. Right? What good is it? Anthony Bourdain has a t-shirt. And it says this. I saw it online. It's hard to imagine they could sell many of them now. But this is what it says. It says, your body is not a temple. It is an amusement park. Enjoy the ride. Well, that's catchy. I can see why people like that. Oh, yeah, party, right? It's an amusement park. Enjoy the ride. Woohoo! Well, he, he didn't enjoy the ride, and he wanted off, and he killed himself. So we can fool ourselves all we want, and think it's all about party and fun and me, and woohoo, I get to do what I want, I own the vineyard. But if you don't build with the cornerstone of Christ and submit your life to him, you're building an empty building that will only lead to despair, and eternally despair. Verse 18, everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. When people walk through life, they come and they're confronted with Jesus. Some messenger somewhere along the way brought Jesus to them. And they said, nah, I don't want that. Or they try to ignore or walk around the stone. You can't really do it. Because really what the Bible teaches us, you're going to trip over the stone. You're going to trip and you're going to fall. And if you ever take a glass vessel and dropped it on a concrete driveway, it shatters into a million little pieces. That's the fate and the situation of all who try to ignore, walk around, or bypass Jesus. They will trip. They will stumble upon Christ. First Peter says he's a stone that makes them stumble, and they will be shattered. But then it reverses it, and it says, But he on whom it falls will be crushed. That's final judgment. All who are broken and who stumble over Christ and don't submit their lives to him, one day they're going to stand before the king. I think the same before the cornerstone of the living and the dead of heaven and earth. And that stone will crush them as he sends them off to the flames for a crushing eternity. Verse 19. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew that he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the people. They understood that they were the wretched tenants. They understood he said he's the son of God. They're going to kill him. And they understood that he says, and you're going to get judged big time for it. Hmm. So how do we react to the words of Jesus? There's only two ways. You can embrace, embrace the words of Christ and submit yourself to his authority, or you can try to ignore or reject it, which is the same thing, or get angry. Hmm. Those are the only options for man. So this morning, as we come to a time of prayer, what has God said to you today? Where have you found yourself in the scripture? Where have you found Christ? Remember, we're just renters. We don't own the vineyard. Maybe you've been acting a little bit like you own the vineyard and you need to give up the fruit to Christ and surrender and let the owner of everything have the harvest.
So where are you this morning? As we close our eyes and bow our heads, listen to the Holy Spirit. And this morning, if you found that you think you own the vineyard or you've been living that way, maybe you need to submit and give up the ownership and bow before the authority of the one who owns everything. Lord Jesus, Father in heaven, Holy Spirit, God triune, in all your glory and splendor, here we are before you today. We thank you for this crazy level of patience and mercy and grace that we see displayed in this parable in the Bible, in the history of your work with us in Israel. But Lord, we do recognize your mercy doesn't go on forever, that there will be a day when the owner will come and judge all things. So Lord, if there's anybody here this morning who's been playing the fool, who's been living as if they own the vineyard, I pray that they might submit their lives to you now and stop living as they have been living. That they might even pray right now with me, Lord Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, I'm sorry. Forgive my sin. Forgive my wayward heart. I give myself to you now, fresh and new. Take all of the vineyard. I confess that I have sinned and been stubborn and rebellious and ask for your mercy on my life. I thank you, Jesus, for your blood shed at the cross for me. I will not reject it anymore, but I apply it to my life by faith. I now turn from my sin and trust in you, Jesus. I will now produce good fruit with your help and strength to obey and to love you. So thank you, Lord. For who you are, we thank you for your word. Help us, Lord, to live a life that gives you all the fruit and all the glory. Forgive our failings, O oh God, and give us strength to serve you each and every day. Lord, we pray for our world, we pray for our families, we pray for our friends. That they would see one day that you own it all and they need to surrender the vineyard to you. So we commit those people to you today. Help us to do our parts and share. Help us to be those messengers, Lord, to share your love. And though we get frustrated and though we get tired of it over and over again, their rejection, Lord, we know we're working under your grace and your patience, and this is your plan. So awaken them soon, we ask. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. And for your sake, we pray these things. Amen. Well, now in our last song, we do have our family altar time. The kids should be bustling over here, I'm sure, any moment. So grab your family.